Good morning, church. How many of you have survived Thanksgiving? <laughs> all right, we're ready to go into another season here. So I want to welcome all of you here today. And we'd like to welcome everyone that's watching us through live streaming. We want to thank the decorating committee for transforming the church from Thanksgiving right into Christmas. They did a good job. Give them a hand. <laughs> Since we don't pay them, I just thought we'd give them a hand. Well, as you all know, you take your bulletin and register attendance by tearing off the tab on the outside of the bulletin and dropping that in the offering plate. Uh, on that, you can also put your prayer request prayer requests, questions, or any other information you want Pastor Dan to have. The Deaconess Board is requesting hats, gloves, coats, mittens for grade school kids. So if you could bring those in by December 11th, that would really be nice. Or if you can't get out and shop, give us the cash, we'll buy something. Buck and Bobby... I want to thank everybody who helped with the Operation Christmas Child shoebox ministry this year. And they had a tremendous turnout of people helping and had a lot of shoeboxes to take to the distribution center. How last, many did they have, Jane? Well, last year we packed 813 boxes. And this year we packed 822. Yay! When we combined that with the community shoe boxes, we sent 83 crates and that had 1,220 total boxes. So yay for that. And we'd like to thank the Hall brothers for providing the Raminator Semi that pulled right up to the front door out here and loaded all of the crates onto that. So thank you, Hall brothers. Is our awning still up? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Mark didn't pull it under there. Hey, next week, you believe next week is December the 3rd? Guess what? We're going to have a little special uh, family Christmas open house at the church. So write that down Saturday from 3 to 5 p.m. Come enjoy time to spend with your family on making crafts, hearing a story, and participate in other fun activities as you learn more about the reason for the season. That's next Saturday. Also, the deacon and deaconess will not meet in the month of December. There will be no prayer breakfast or meeting. And the new daily breads are back in Fultz Hall for December through February. So as we transition, we've got a special family that's going to help us with Advent candle. And uh, Ty and Betsy, as you know, grew up in this church. And five years ago, this church was praying for Bo. And as you can see, Bo's doing okay right now, but when he was born at Lurie's Hospital, he had several medical situations that you all were praying for, so we appreciate that. Bo brought his lovely sister, Eleanor, so would you guys come up and help us with the Advent? It may seem a little early to you, but we are past Thanksgiving, we are officially into the Christmas season, and today is the first Sunday of Advent. The word Advent means coming, and during the Christmas season, it refers to the coming of Jesus to earth. During the four Sundays prior to Christmas, the church has for centuries reflected on the true significance of Christmas by lighting a different candle each week to emphasize different aspects of Christ's coming. On the first day of Advent, we celebrate the hope that we can have because of the coming of Jesus to, the, to our world. The story of Jesus' birth is one that is filled with the message of hope. Hear the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1, 18 through 23. Now this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiance, being just a man, decided to break the engagement quietly so as not to disgrace her publicly. As he considered this, he fell asleep. 
and an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to go ahead with your marriage to Mary, for the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this happened to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. God is with us, and the presence of God is the greatest present we could ever receive because it gives us hope. As we light this first candle of Advent, let us give thanks to God for the great hope we have because Jesus, our Savior, came to earth on Christmas morn. Good job. <laughs> Let's spend a few minutes in silent prayer, and then I'll end it. But take this time to meditate and commun communicate yourself with God. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you on this season, and we want to remember just how much you do love us. You sent your only son to come to this earth to give us hope, hope eternal. We're thankful that Jesus came and showed us how to live. We're thankful that he came to take away all of our sins, and he did this because you love us. We want to remember it in this time of this season going forward and for all the many blessings that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Now if the musicians would come forward and the praise team, and if you feel led, stand up, and if you feel led, sit down, but just sing.
Most holy Lord Jesus, we are eternally grateful for the privilege we have of standing in your presence because you came. You came to us, Lord, as baby Jesus. You sent to us, Holy Father, your one and only Son, who would be able to be born among us and live among us and teach us, Lord, all that we need to know to live for you a holy life, a life set apart to bring glory to your name. Father God, as we celebrate once again this Christmas season, your coming, we pray, O Emmanuel, that you will indeed show us that you're here with us. Help us know your presence in our midst. Help us share with others that great and glorious news that Jesus Christ, our Savior, has come. Just bless this service, Lord. Bless it to your glory as we worship you, as we love you, as we rekindle the spirit of our, the fire and flame within our hearts, Lord, to share the good news of your coming. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. At this time, our ushers will come forward, and as we do, they'll also have Dan come forward to sub for the mission committee and share a mission moment for us. Alan and Colleen were supposed to do the mission moment this morning, but they are both under the weather, so I said I'd be glad to substitute in. Our mission moment today highlights Craig and Allison Fowler, who are currently serving in Ethiopia. Allison attended our church when her father, Dean Heurig, was an associate pastor here at First Baptist Church. After Allison and Craig were married and joined the mission field, our church has been supporters of their mission both in our regular budgeted giving and through special Christmas offerings, giving to their well project. The Fowlers have faithfully served in Ethiopia for the past 17 years. That's a long time. A major part of their ministry is to plant churches and to train leaders in the town of Asosa. According to Craig, our goal is not simply to plant churches, but to plant self-sustaining self-leading and reproducing churches. We could spend a lot of time on those words. But he wants churches that will keep going, that have life in them. In addition to their church plants, the Fowlers are busy with their water project, digging new wells in surrounding villages, but also in their prison outreach. A major goal of Craig's is to develop strong church leaders. They currently partner with about 50 churches statewide in church development. As far as family update, the Fowlers have two kids in the U.S. attending university. Zane, 21, is living, working, and going to school in central Illinois. He's studying nursing. Ezra, 19, is a freshman at Milligan University in Johnson City, Tennessee, where he is studying chemistry for a pre-pharmacy degree. And their youngest, Anna, 16, is a junior in high school at Rift Valley in Kenya. So they certainly are, are spread out and have a lot of interest in a lot of places. We want to thank you for helping to support them and make that possible. And I like our mission uh, emphasis from time to time to remind us that we do have a ministry here in Rantoul, but also we have uh, outreach that goes way beyond uh, the walls of this church and way beyond our community as we're reaching out far and wide into all the world uh, to help others preach the gospel. If the ushers would come forward this time, and uh, we will have our, our prayer for the offering. God, we thank you for those who generously give to you in your uh, ministry. We thank you for putting your love in people's hearts that they were concerned, they are concerned about reaching out to others. But help us all to have a heart of compassion. Help us all to be sensitive to the needs of those around us. And help us, God, to look beyond our own needs, our own concerns, to look to the needs of others, God. And as we uh, give this offering to you, we ask that you would use it to your glory and to, your, to further your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name.
as we get more birthdays behind us, it seems that the, the calendar goes faster and faster. It seems like it wasn't long ago that we were complaining that it was hot, and now it's rainy and cool, and Thanksgiving is behind us, and Christmas is right around the corner. The first Sunday of Advent actually kind of stuck up on me this year. I was thinking about you know, doing worship leaders, and, and I, I double booked for this morning. Uh, I, I had Terrence to, to be the worship leader this morning, then I forgot I had asked him to be the worship leader, so I asked uh, you know, the Hardens to come be the worship leaders with the um, uh, Advent candle, and so I double booked this morning. Thank you, Terrence, for being gracious, and, and thanks to the Hardens for uh, being willing to, to come be part of the celebration. I, I love uh, Christmas. I, I think I've shared with you before. One of the, the DeWitt uh, Christmas traditions every year when we uh, get together to, to celebrate Christmas, and before we open presents, we will gather around, and it used to be Dad, that he's gone to be with the Lord, but, but Dad would open up the Bible, and he would read one of the, the passages out of the Bible, and I was always thankful when he did not read the first chapter of Matthew, it has all the lists of names of who was begat whom and all, all of the begats that were on there in the King James Version because and I know some of you will be disappointed to hear this because you gave your life teaching history. <laughs> I've never been a fan of history because as far as I was concerned, it was a matter of memorizing names, names of people, names of places, and then you throw in a few dates, and that just wasn't really something that excited me, sorry. But God included in in first book of the New Covenant, the New Testament, Matthew, almost the entire first chapter is devoted to names. Now, I understand from, from the Jewish perspective why they did that, because the, the, the prophecies predicted that, or proclaimed, or prophesied, that the Messiah would be a descendant of error from the a lion of the tribe of Judah. And he, they wanted to show, Matthew wanted to show, and Luke wanted to show, the, the genealogies that, that established the fact that, yes, in fact, Jesus came from the tribe of David. He was a... a, a descendant of David, he was from the, the lineage of Judah, and he wanted to prove that Jesus did qualify, he met that, and that was real important to them. Most of us really, okay, I'm not going to project my feelings on you, I really don't like reading Matthew chapter 1, I, I, I generally, I don't spend a lot of time reading there, and uh, I don't spend a lot of time uh, going through a lot of stuff like that in the Bible, but God put it there for a reason. And this morning, we're going to read the first six verses of Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to do it for a specific reason. I'm not going to talk about all the people in those first six verses, all, all that, though it would be a really fascinating series of studies if we did. And we looked at all of those people and, and the, their stories spiritual story, the relationship with God, the things they did. But this morning I'm going to focus on a couple of people, on the first six verses. I was going to do four. And as I was thinking about it, I said, no, let, let's trim this down to just two. Because there's a couple of people whose stories really stand out to me. And, and I look at their place in this story, and to be quite honest, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at the Holy Spirit included their names specifically. It didn't just try to hide their part of Jesus' lineage under the, under the floor, under the rug, hide it in the corner, sweep it in the carpet. I don't know if that's me or what that is. Um, how about, Terrence, if I grab this mic up here? This is number five. Even if that didn't distract you, it was distracting to me. So we're going to look at a couple of people's 
who are listed in the first six verses of Matthew chapter 1, which deals with the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron was the father of Ram, and Ram was the father of Amimadab. The secret to saying these weird names is to say them quickly with a sense of authority, and nobody will question you. <laughs> Amimadab was the father of Nashon, and Nashon was the father of Salmon, and Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, and Ub Ebad, Obed was the father, I lost my sense of authority there. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, Solomon whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. May God add his blessings to the reading of the word. If you're really, really familiar with the Old Testament stories, there, there's some of those stories there that you look at and they spark a whole lot of thought processes. Verse 6, Bathsheba. You remember the story of Bathsheba, right? We're not going to talk about Bathsheba. In, in the whole Me Too uh, culture, uh, Bathsheba is considered a, a victim. Uh, perhaps she was raped, maybe not. But this was a union with King David. It was an adulterous relationship. And why, oh why, does God point that out in the genealogy? It would have been easy just to say David was the father of Solomon, period. And not include that parent in my Bible as a parathetical statement about Bathsheba, and not only mention Bathsheba, but also include specific reference to Uriah in case you missed it, and you want to go back and read the story. He says, look up and Google Bathsheba and Uriah, and then think about that for a little bit. Now, if that's not enough, you could drop down to, to verse 5. There, there's a reference to Ruth. Now, Ruth was a pretty good person, and, you know, there's a great story about Ruth, but, but Ruth was a member of the nation of Moab. If you read through Genesis, I think it's Genesis 19, there's a story about a, in, a really yucky story about Lot and his daughters and how they got pregnant from their father, and the descendants were Moabites. So why did we have this reference to this Moabite woman in the descendants of Jesus? And we're not going to talk about Ruth. We're not going to talk about Bathsheba. We're going to go back up a couple. We're going to talk about one that's even more obscure, perhaps more cringeworthy, the story of Tamar, verse 3. In, in verse 3, we, we hear, see mention of Tamar. Now, to see the story of Tamar, you go back to Genesis chapter 38. And as this weird story, it's very cringeworthy. We, we see that Tamar was married to a son of Judah. And the, her husband was apparently an evil person, and he died. And they didn't get married long enough for Tamar to become pregnant. And back in that day, the, the cultural laws of the land was that if a man dies and his wife, the widow, did not have children, then the dead man's brother would then go marry the widow. And the first child, particularly the first male child to that union, was not the second husband's child. That was the first husband's child. And so, and that's what happened with, with Tamar. Her first husband died. The second husband, which was the brother of the, the dead man, married Tamar. But the second husband was also a pretty rough guy, and he didn't want Tamar to get pregnant. 
and have his brother's child so he didn't let her become pregnant. And so dad, uh, the second husband died, and dad, Judah, said, well, I'm not going to lose child number three to this woman. She's some kind of black widow. That's my statement, not his. And so he had a third son who was pretty young. He says, hey, hey, go home, live with your parents again. When my third son gets old enough, I'll send him over and he'll marry you. Well, he never did. So time went on, years passed by, and Tamar realized that she was never going to marry the third son. But she heard that father-in-law, Judah, was coming to town with the sheep. So Tamar went and dressed as a prostitute, sat out on the corner pretending to be a temple prostitute, and when Judah came along, his mourning period had had ended from his dead wife, and so he saw the prostitute, and what did Judah do? Judah spent some time with the prostitute, who he didn't know was his daughter-in-law. She became pregnant. So why would God inspire Matthew to include this really weird story in the genealogy of Jesus. I mean, we all have crazy people in our families, right? We all have people in our family tree. We, would really, we really don't want to talk about all that much. We, we, we don't want others to know that that person is part of my family. And if I go on Facebook and I start posting pictures of all my wonderful family members, I never put those people in my posts. Because I don't really want everyone to know that person is my ancient cousin, nephew, uncle, aunt, whatever. I, I try to keep those things off to the side. But when God was having Matthew write the story of the Son of God who came to earth, the Messiah, God in the flesh, God had Matthew specifically refer to Tamar, who pretended to be a prostitute. Wow. Makes you wonder. And then you drop down a little bit further in the first part of verse 5, Rahab. Now, now first of all, most genealogies at that time, it was a very patriarchal society. They didn't include women at all. They, 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 everyone knew there were mothers there, but they, all they really cared about were the fathers because it was a really, really patriarchal society. So to even mention the women was, was strange, but you would assume that if you mention the women, it's because they were outstanding, they were wonderful, they were top of the class, they were the most great examples of purity and righteousness, but the first one he mentioned was someone who pretended to be a prostitute, and the second one he mentioned, Rahab. You read her story in Joshua chapter 2 and in Joshua chapter 6. We find that Rahab, Rahab didn't just pretend to be a prostitute. She was a prostitute. And when the children of Israel, God's chosen people, came to the promised land and they were there to, to bring the kingdom of earth. I'm kind of being sarcastic a little bit. They were bringing the kingdom of earth to that place and God's presence among them in the tabernacle and the, the holy presence of God was to go into Canaan. The, what did these representatives of God's people do? They went to a prostitute. And that was included in the story. But, but why would Moses talk about that? And then also, why would Moses specifically refer to Rahab as being in the line of lineage of Jesus? I, I've thought about that quite a bit. And the only answer I can come up with personally God wants us to know that he loves people who have messy lives. All of us 
have messy lives. All of us have chapters of our lives, seasons of our lives, episodes in our lives that we really aren't all that proud about. That we've done things, maybe we still do things that, that we, we know isn't right, we know we shouldn't be doing, and, and our lives can be messed up. But I see in the genealogy of Jesus a statement loud and clear. There's hope for the messed up people. There's hope for us. Even though at times we are messed up. And you read just a little bit further in Matthew chapter 1. You go down to verses 18, 19, 20, 21. Part of the Advent reading. Matthew 1, 18, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to publicly disgrace her. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And other than disciples later on, I'm willing to bet no one believed that story. Now, can you imagine what Mary's mom and dad felt like? When she came with that news? Can you imagine what the small community around her all thought when Mary had to go off in her pregnancy to live with her aunt? Can you imagine what all the people thought whenever they saw Mary and Joseph and Jesus? And they would snicker and say, you remember? For the child was in her, within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a child. And you are to name him Jesus, which basically means the Lord saves. For he will save his people from their sins. That's the part that makes me understand why God included all the stuff about all of the people. And it's not just the, the, the two women I highlighted. You start looking through the stories of all the men that were in Jesus family and you find there's a lot of them were really messed up too. But God used all of those messed up people to bring his son to be born of a virgin, the son of God, God in the flesh, to come to earth so that he could save us from our sins. I see hope for the messed up people, and I too am messed up at times. I was uh, wandering around the church this morning, and uh, somebody handed me this box, and said, go put this underneath the kitchen sink where the, the church recycles stuff is. Well, I, I had seen some stuff underneath that sink in that box, but I really didn't think anything about it. I, I'm not perhaps the most observant person at times, but I went there, and there's all this stuff that, that's in this box, in this crate, and, and it's labeled, please recycle, thank you. And as I saw this tub that says, please recycle, I thought about, all of us messed up people who in and of ourselves are, are maybe we're just nothing but junk and trash and we're just not good for much unless you want to recycle and use it for some other purpose. And I thought about Jesus came to save his people, to save us from our sins. And in a way, he came to recycle us to take us broken down, worn out, 
people who have messed up lives, people who've made a mess of things, people who have done things they know they should not have done. And maybe at times, maybe most of the time, we don't feel all that worthy. We just feel like we just be thrown out, dumped with the trash. But Jesus came to save us from our sins, to recycle us, to take away the, the sinful nature in our heart, to, to regenerate us from the inside out, to, to renew us and to reclaim us and to make us holy and acceptable to him. To where when God looks at us, if we place our faith in Jesus, if we submit our lives to him, if we commit ourselves to him, it doesn't matter what we have done. It doesn't matter what other people think about us. It doesn't matter how messed up we have been or maybe how messed up we are. Jesus came to recycle us. Jesus came to redeem us. And we can be like Tamar. We can be like Rahab. We can be like Bathsheba or David. We can be like all of those messed up people. And God loves us. And God has a future, a hope, a plan for us. God will use us if we would just surrender to him. And give our lives to him. So as we look at the Advent season, we have the message of hope. We have the message of hope for those who are messed up. And I'm glad because we're all messed up in our own way. Let's look to God in prayer. Take a few moments. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. Thank you, God. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time I invite the musicians to come forward and lead us in our closing songs. And if you would, let's stand together as we sing.
receive the benediction of our Lord. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord be good to you and give you his peace. Go in his peace. Amen.